Hi, I'm Greg. I'm the CEO and the founder of Octopus Energy. And um, there's a lot of uh, discussion about our uh, negative price electricity uh, on Twitter, social media generally, and indeed in the media. And um, I wanted to answer a lot of the questions that people are asking and put it in context uh, in ways which um, the 140 or 160, whatever characters of Twitter make uh, difficult. So the first thing is, why are we doing it? Well, look, there are two kinds of negative prices going on with Octopus this weekend. The first is customers on our Agile tariff. Um, that's purely formulaic. We have no say in the pricing there. Uh, the way Agile works is there's a formula published on our website which turns wholesale energy prices into the prices we charge customers on a half-hourly basis. So every half hour, um, we take the you know, market price um, as it was at market close at 4 p.m. the day before, just to be clear, uh, multiply it by 2.2, add on some fixed charges at certain times, and that formula is fixed. So, uh, Agile pricing, other than the fact we set the formula, you know, whenever we launched Agile quite a while ago now, uh, we have no say about it. Um, so that's the sort of genuine effect of the electricity market um, flowing its way through to customers. We also have um, a large number of customers, over 100,000 that we've invited to uh, take part in you know, large-scale um, trials. Uh, where we are paying them a, a modest amount per kilowatt hour for electricity to use in uh, windows on Sunday, uh, the day at which I think National Grid forecast blows demand. Um, and um, both Agile and indeed those trials are really part of Octopus's experimentation with what the future of energy looks like. Let me put that kind of uh, in context. We have to work, move towards more renewables. It's the only way uh, we can uh, damage, uh, reduce the damage caused by climate change um, whilst continuing to use energy in, in the ways that, that you know, uh, are hugely beneficial to society. Um, now, moving towards renewables uh, totally changes how the system works. Our system was designed you know, over the last 100 or more years around uh, highly predictable uh, coal and other uh, fossil fuel sources with some nuclear and, and small amounts of, um, for example, hydro thrown in. That's the UK, obviously the mix is different in different countries. And um, uh, as we move towards a renewable system, so a lot of the um, kind of existing design, whether it be the design of the infrastructure, like where we need transmission and distribution cables, uh, or the design of the market, how the product is paid for, all of that, um, we can either try and keep it broadly as it is, um, or we can adapt to it. And uh, if we try and keep it broadly as it is, basically means we've got to spend an absolute fortune trying to make renewables look like coal. Um, yeah, so that the grid carries on working the way it always has done. Um, history tells us that when you have a new technology and try to make the existing system treat it like the old technology, uh, you tend to create enormous cost and, and often disasters. You know, look, I, I was thinking, you know, the Boeing 737 MAX, the, the, the plane that unfortunately had a number of crashes. What had gone on there was um, Boeing had tried to, they, they changed the, the place the engine was on the plane for a pile of reasons when they redesigned the plane. But they wanted to make the controls of the plane essentially behave the way they used to. So there's some software in between. And it just turns out that when you try to take uh, a totally different form, in this case of, of, of motion generation, um, and make the system behave the same, you pile up a whole load of problems. And it will be the same with energy. If we try to make the system behave the same when it's powered by renewables as it was when it's powered by coal, um, it's going to cost us more, uh, a, a, an awful lot more, and it's going to be much more wasteful. So uh, Octopus launched the Agile Tariff, and now we're trying these trials to start seeing how um, things change when customers are able to make the most of cheap electricity when you know uh, demand is low, when the wind's blowing, the sun's shining. And the simplest thing, no argument about it, is that uh, if people use energy at times when you know, there's a lot of green generation, that's going to be good because they'll be using energy that they would otherwise have used when you know, the grid was less green. Um, but of course, um, things have changed this weekend. There's literally times that people have been paid to use electricity. And uh, you know, I'm seeing a lot of people on Twitter saying, is it wasteful? You know, should I you know, fill my kettle? Should I use electricity in ways I wouldn't have done before? And I think that's really the purpose of, of the trials we're doing, is to find out a couple of things. Um, 
Uh, first of all, the background is National Grid at the moment need to uh, get rid of, according to media reports, 3.7 gigawatts of electricity. And the ways they'll get rid of that are um, you know, trying to find industrial users who uh, will take it off their hands. Uh, that's difficult at times of COVID, of course. Uh, or turning off generation. Now, turning off fossil fuel generation is fine. Um, you know, uh, every unit you're not generating with fossil fuels, you're using less coal and less gas. That produces less carbon. And also, by the way, it costs less because you're not having to pay for the coal and the gas that are going into that generation. It's more complex with renewables. Um, uh, the investment in the wind farms and the solar farms has already been made. Uh, so uh, the electricity generation is essentially a, you know, near enough free. There might be a little bit of depreciation, particularly in wind, where, you know, as the turbines are turning, there's a small amount of wear and tear, but it's, it's negligible in this context. So uh, we've got this question, you know, when we have uh, free electrons being generated um, and there are more than we need, is it better to turn off the generation or is it better to pay people to use them? Now, if we pay people to use them, there's a couple of things that are going to happen. Uh, the first is some people are going to move consumption that they would have done at another time to the time when they're getting paid. That's fantastic. Um, but then some people might actually use electricity they wouldn't otherwise have used. Today, that may be bonkers things like, you know, turning on the heating with the windows open or, you know, boiling kettles unnecessarily. Uh, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, on Twitter, I see, you know, this kind of suggestion, it's potentially wasteful. I totally get that. Um, and, um, uh, but we are in this odd place where if you don't use those electrons, National Grid will be paying other people to use them or indeed paying generators to not generate them. Um, so uh, however we look at it, those electrons uh, need to be, uh, someone's going to be paying uh, either to stop generating them or to get someone to use them. And if that's the case, is it better that we share with customers the benefit of um, uh, the ability to get paid to use them? Or do we just leave that at a place where market traders and um, uh, you know, large industrial users um, get paid? So uh, I think there's a really interesting question there. And, and the answer is not obvious. What's really important is that until we start doing things like this, uh, a number of surveys have been done that said basically energy customers wouldn't respond to price signals. And, um, you know, the reason that we launched Agile Tariff and, and that we're doing these trials is to find the extent to which, um, you know, price signals, whether it be lower prices, higher prices or even negative prices, change consumption behavior in energy. And um, uh, the data we're getting from this tells us the extent to which different levels of price change have different effects on consumption. We learned the price elasticity de uh, de demand in electricity. That's going to be hugely, hugely valuable as Octopus, other companies, government and regulator start moving towards, uh, you know, what are the plans for a renewable grid? How fast can we take renewables? And what do the average prices end up being? So there's a whole load of stuff going on here beyond just, you know, kind of the behavior we're seeing that really help us not only kind of reward people today, but far more importantly, plan for a much faster transition to renewables. So everyone who's taking part in these debates, everyone who's taking part in the experiments and the trials or using these tariffs is helping contribute to that. That's the big story. A couple of other quick things. Uh, first of all, um, uh, some people have, I've seen some tweets about people where we haven't got a smart meter quick enough or where the smart meter is not working. And I'm sorry about that. Um, a bit of context there though. Um, you know, we've got hundreds of thousands of smart meters on the wall, and we, you know, the actual number of people with the problem is small. It's just that in, you know, until tariffs like Agile, these trials happen, uh, people have been much less bothered about, you know, does a smart meter kind of work consistently every half hour or not? Um, and of course now, if you're one of the people, one of those very small number, but affected by that, you're kind of missing out, and that can feel awful. Um, and I am really sorry about that. Uh, we do try to say everywhere that it's all in beta. And, you know, if you've been trying to get a smart meter office for months or there's been a data issue for months, it feels worse. Um, we've blogged a lot about what it takes to debug that system because uh, the entire infrastructure from the meters to the home area network to the transmission systems that get the data back to us, uh, which vary between the north and the south, through to the government controlled uh, data communications company, through the company that take the data from them to us and through our own systems. All of that has to work every half hour for us to reliably produce the bills behind Agile and, and, and so on. And debugging that on a case-by-case -case basis can take a long time. Um, it, one day it won't be like that. 
Uh, it's just while the system's bedding down, whether it be us, our suppliers, the companies that you know, we're forced to use, uh, the companies that um, the government have chosen, the companies that are building the meters, the companies that are building the firmware that goes on the meters, and everyone else, uh, we're all kind of just working together to find to, to kind of make that whole end-to-end -end system work better for customers. And again, by the way, people who really want to be part of this, uh, even just debugging your meters is part of the process that will enable us to move to a much faster transition to renewables. So um, the good news is, by the way, you, uh, on, like on a trial this weekend, most people are missing out on a tiny amount of money. But the fact that that matters to you, I'm really, really glad that you're kind of uh, giving us grief or the system grief uh, to try and make it work. And um, as soon as we can get things working for you, the better. Obviously not helped by COVID. And, um, you know, you've got to remember that the COVID issue started m long before lockdown. Uh, you know, there were times when it was getting harder to get people in people's houses. But even before that, because there's lockdowns in China, some of the supply chain wasn't working as well. It was hard to get answers out of factories. So, um, you know, essentially for the whole of this year, we've had a bit of a slowdown and then a hiatus in solving these issues. But um, uh, rest assured, people are working hard on it. And I hope we can um, uh, you know, bring you the benefits over time. Uh, people are asking, uh, how do Octopus make money in this? Uh, the reality is at the moment we don't. Uh, in fact, we're investing millions in it. And um, we're doing that because uh, you know, the much bigger picture for us is that the transition to a cleaner grid here in the UK and indeed globally is one that's got to be led by customers. Uh, it's got to have a technology at the heart of it to make it uh, low cost and quick. And so this is all part of our investment in learning what will work. Uh, technically, uh, when uh, grid prices go negative, we do get paid by generators for the energy we're taking off, uh, which is great. Uh, but unfortunately, the way that the transmission distribution systems work today is we essentially pay a poll tax for every electron that goes down the wires. And that poll tax is essentially very, very flat. So um, I think it costs us between 6 and 8p per kilowatt hour to um, just get the electron down the wires, regardless of what it costs us to buy. So even when the, you know, the wholesale price has gone quite heavily negative, that um, kind of, uh, transmission distribution charges and a bunch of other things in there um, mean that uh, you know, we're not making money. In fact, we're you know, losing money, or should I say, we're investing in uh, these experiments to find out how things really work. Um, and uh, I've also been asked um, whether uh, this is kind of uh, fair, distributionally fair. You know, is it just helping rich electric vehicle drivers uh, rather than you know, low-income households? Uh, Octopus from the very beginning has been focused on bringing down cost of energy for low-income households. It's one of the reasons we campaigned hard on the price cap. Um, but I think what we see in energy is very similar to what we've seen in mobile phones. Uh, the first iPhones cost a fortune and geeks queued up outside the Apple store to get them. Um, I run a technology company at the time, a load of our team were queued up outside the Apple store, and I honestly thought, you know, um, I thought it was crazy. Uh, but then what I saw was that uh, very quickly, that tiny number of kind of geeky people and Apple fan customers um, shared what they were finding with others and, and some you know, more kind of uh, early adopters uh, saw the iPhone and I'm like wow that's really interesting went and I, I was the same I went out and bought one a few months in fact I had to wait for one to be delivered because the people who queued were actually smarter than me um because they saw how good it was uh anyway I waited to get mine delivered and I got an iPhone and when I showed it to my mum uh my mum said uh, that's ridiculous uh what's wrong with a landline and um so the, the kind of uh, you've got the geeks, the early adopters, then the sort of begins to go mainstream, but you still got a lot of people who will say, this isn't for me. Um, but, you know, now my mum spends most of her time on a, I don't know, a 40 pound Android phone um, on Facebook um, and many other things. She's 72 years old, by the way. And, um, and my gran, who's in her 90s, uses a cheap Android phone. And so what happened is that the early adopters um, spent a lot of money on products that got uh, the sort of technology uh, more mature and then the cost drops massively and it goes mainstream and um, where we are now is that that's kind of normal and that's what's going to happen with uh, energy um, the opportunity to enjoy cheap energy uh, at times when the sun's blowing the wind's shining or other dynamics are at play low demand or whatever uh, means that increasingly more and more people more and more mainstream people can grab a bargain and um, uh, that is going to bring down the cost of energy for everyone. And let's remember, 
that bringing down the cost of energy, uh, using this renewable energy when it's available, uh, brings down the cost of renewable energy overall, which then makes the average cost lower for even those that don't take part in um, kind of this time of use stuff. Now, of course, if there's a small number of people left who only use their energy at peak time, then uh, you know, there's a risk that they'll end up paying more. But actually, um, even there, uh, you know, we're talking about things like um, if you, uh, you have your tea at six o'clock and you have to do that, and that's at peak time. If you do the washing up at seven or 7.30, it's a lot better than doing it at 6.30. There is nothing wrong with people getting that signal. And of course, the more people move their consumption to the off-peak times, the times when there's a lot available, so the differential between the two comes down. And the more people respond to real-time energy prices, actually, the flatter the system becomes. Uh, so some of those inequalities start to go away as well. So I really hope that helps put in perspective um, how we see this week's uh, weekend's um, experiments with negative pricing and um, uh, kind of gives you a sense of some of the thoughts behind it from Octopus's point of view as we pioneer our way forward. But remember, this is just the very beginning and whatever we're doing at the moment is going to be informing what we, other companies, regulators and governments here in the UK and globally are doing to help invest in um, a faster transition to renewables. And that's got to be a good thing. Thank you.